And we are live. Everybody, while we're waiting folks for folks to roll in, can you introduce yourself, starting with Mark? My name is Mark McClish, and I'm glad to be here tonight. All right, tell us about yourself. I know you're former Secret Service, former U.S. Um, Marshal. Start off with the Secret Service, uh, retired with the U.S. Marshal Service. In 2009, I taught uh, interviewing for nine years at the U.S. Marshal Service Training Academy. That's where I developed the uh, statement analysis techniques to detect deception of verbal and written statement. Retired in 2009, and now I travel around the country conducting classes on uh, interviewing techniques using statement analysis. All right. You also did body language too while you were there, right? So you're a little, little body language. Um, I wouldn't consider myself an expert at body language, but I know enough to detect deception. But uh, Analyzing the language is what I specialize in. Okay, I wanted to ask because I, I have so many people on and nobody seems to be, you know, a one disciplined person. It's like, eh, everybody's got a little of this, a little of that to enhance it. And welcome back. We have Lena Cisco. Tell us about yourself, Lena. So first, I'm thrilled to be here because I'm a huge fan of Mark. So I'm very <laughs> excited. Um, I'm a former Navy Intel officer, but Marine Corps certified interrogator. And I interrogated um, Al Qaeda and Taliban shortly after 9-11 down in Gitmo. After that time, um, gosh, I've been training for two decades now, law enforcement, government agency personnel and military personnel in interrogation, interviewing, elicitation, detecting deception, both nonverbal and verbal. Um, I worked on a TV show for three years as an expert witness detecting lies, and I published a couple of books on it. How is it, uh, really quickly, Alina, how is it on the television show versus, you, you know, you're training cops, you're in Gitmo. How are the circumstances different? <sighs> Uh, gosh, you know, I can tell you how they were the same. So even though okay. the show was, uh, let's say, plumped up <laughs> to get the ratings and drama. Uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of drama, the producers want the drama because that's what, you know, uh, attracts people. But every time I talked to a litigant, when they came in the room, I really had to work to figure out whether or not they were trying to lie to me or they, they were telling me the truth. So that part was completely legit. And let me tell you, there were a couple of difficult interviews that I had and a couple that were so easy. <laughs> I'm curious about one thing. Is it a little bit like, um, have you read the controversies of the Stanford prison experiment by chance? Yes, yes. That the people involved, some of them are coming out and saying, hey, uh, I was supposed to be a guard and they kind of put me up to be a badass or they put me up to be a hard case. Do you get accusations on the show of producers maybe needling a little bit like saying well you know you could push that story a little bit more it just be more entertaining the needling actually came with the theatrics in the courtroom but not pertaining to the story because what i loved about the show that i worked on and the producer is that he knew that we are very serious and we take our craft very seriously and so i would never jeopardize my reputation to go on and work for a show that didn't allow me to be authentic so that's what i really enjoyed about it um we took all that the polygraph we had a polygraph examiner a private investigator voice stress analysis i detect i was the interrogator we all did our jobs very seriously and so the needling came with the theatrics in the courtroom okay and mark um have you hit different areas i mean i know you teach with cops and things like that i, I didn't know if you might have had other uh, varied experiences and backgrounds and what you do, acting as an advisor, consultant, et cetera? Well, anybody who uh, conducts interviews, uh, I will train. So sometimes it's human resources personnel. You know, they're interviewing people for jobs or investigate employee misconduct. Uh, counselors will sometimes come to my training because they're dealing with clients. And I would think the first thing you want to know is, is this person being truthful or not, you know, your client. But from primarily my audience is law enforcement since that's what my background was in. Do you ever do any kind of um, trial consultation out of curiosity? I haven't done any. I'm open to do that, but it's not something that I usually pursue or advertise. Um, I get asked all the time, uh, can you testify as an expert witness? I say I can, but you don't need me. You don't need me on the stand to point out when Bill Clinton said I tried to be truthful, the word tried means he wasn't truthful. You need me there to point out what the person is saying. And so I usually talk myself out of having to testify. 
Well, is that admissible in court? Because uh, I know the polygraph is not. I, I didn't know the statement analysis was. Uh, the majority of techniques would be because it's based on the English language. Now, there's a few things I teach. Uh, as Lena mentioned, the number three is a deceptive number. That would not fly in a courtroom, obviously. But most of the techniques are based on English language, pronouns, verb tenses. So, yeah, it could be used. An attorney could point it out what the witness has said you know, to the jury. Oh, okay. So you could break down a deposition and say the the uh, defendant was asked this question, but their answer does not directly answer what was asked, that kind of thing? That, that could be part of it. I've seen uh, defendants take the stand, which is kind of unusual, and actually confess to the crime, but it goes unnoticed. But if you listen to how he phrased his statement or answered questions, and a good in that case, prosecuting attorney could point that out to the jury during closing arguments. This is exactly what he said, and that's what he meant, you know, that he, he did it based on his language. Actually, in your book, didn't you write about a cop who did just that? Yeah, he was accused of planting a pipe bomb. Uh, he denied it, but he took the stand and testified his own defense. And under uh, direct examination by his attorney, and tell his story what happened, he said that he... Uh, basically, what he said was he recovered the device. Well, the word recover means to regain or reclaim something. He should have said he discovered or he found the device. But he did just that. He recovered it and then uh, he reported to the police. And, to the police. He was convicted. They didn't, they didn't pick up on that, but he was convicted of those charges. Okay. Fascinating. Fascinating. Lena, I think you sent your link to this to somebody else. <laughs> They need to watch on YouTube. Uh, Roseanne Cisco. Oh, yes. That would be my <laughs> mom. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye, mom. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm glad Christine H. has a question here. And this is awesome. Um, everybody, that's why we're here. Please ask questions. I don't want to hog the spotlight of everyone. Um, Christine H., Lena, what interviews were challenging and why? Maybe an example or two. Oh, um, I guess in regards to the interrogations or any civilian about, or the TV show. How about one of those and one of the TV shows? Because that oh. that'll be a great juxtaposition. You have actual potential terrorists and you have, well, reality TV stars. I don't yeah. know who's more dangerous, but, you know, we can. Well, you know, I actually just thought of something. I said the word actually because I didn't know I was going to say this. And now I do. Uh, the most difficult is when I just am across the, the table from someone or sitting next to them and they just don't want to talk to me. Just everything. And I'm pulling and it's like pulling mm. teeth. And it's. I call it uh, mental sparring. What can I do next to get this person to open up and trust me? And it's a mix of doing the rapport and then using some elicitation and just feeling out this person. But those are my most difficult interviews is when I just know the person next to me does not want to be in the room with me, does not want to talk to me. And they just, you know, one word answers this. And it's really like pulling teeth. Now I work for it. And I will get you to talk um, because I have this technique where I create a very safe environment and it's very rapport based. It's using a lot of empathy um, and it's knowing exactly what words that I need to say, right, to get you to open up. Um, words, I call myself a word nerd because although I'm analyzing yours, I have to be careful of the ones I'm using too. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah, that would be my answer. The most difficult are when I just am with a person who just does not want to talk to me. How about you, Mark? I would agree with Lena. And the other thing I find troublesome is when you know the person is lying. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it gets to the point you point out to them that they're lying, but they still, at that point, you're looking for a confession, but they still won't confess mm -hmm. or they won't admit that they're lying to you. And so that just you know, makes it harder because you want that confession. Uh, in an investigation, you may have the evidence to prove that they did it, and that's what you're going to have to go with in court. But ideally, you like to get them to confess and just gets frustrating when you know they're lying, you point it out to them they're lying, uh, they still won't want to admit to that. That's an interesting question. Should you always point out that they are lying? Or are there times that you want them to just go ahead, keep on going, keep on going, keep on going? Yeah, you want, them to keep on, you want them to keep on going. Um, if you point out, it's like with non-verbs, where you keep touching your lips, they're gonna stop touching their lips then. So if you point something out to them, then they start to pick up on it. So ideally, get a statement from them, let them say what they want to say, start interviewing them. 
if they're not answering your specific question, they answer your question with a question, you're picking up on all this stuff. Um, but eventually you're hoping to get them, once you know that you have the right suspect, this person did it, they're at least they're lying to you, then you're hoping eventually they're gonna confess uh, to that or tell you the truth at least. Okay, I think you've written a lot about that too. Um, oh, she mentioned actually being a trigger on that for a, a, an example, because what is it? Uh, I think you've written that if somebody says actually blah, 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 then that means that they were going to do or say something else, but they changed up. Is that? Uh, yeah. yeah, the word actually always means a person's comparing two thoughts. Mm -hmm. Most of the time you hear the word actually, you'll see the comparison. You know, did you buy a new car? Actually, I bought a new truck. So they're comparing car with truck. And again, 90% of the time you'll see the comparison. That's fine. It's the correct way to use the word actually. But if you don't know what they're comparing, then you have undisclosed information. You know, what did you do last night? Actually, I went to a party. Well, why do they use the word actually? It means you're either thinking about something else they want to do, or perhaps they did do something else and going to a party is a lie. So you're listening for the word actually. It means a comparison. Do you know what they're comparing? Okay. Okay. Um, let's see, Eva has a question. Is there negative aspects of overanalyzing everything and everyone in your life? And if yes, how do you stop yourselves from doing it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't be analyzing everyone in your life. <laughs> I give the, uh, the warning, do not use these techniques on family and friends, or you may not have any more family and friends. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're not, we're not as objective when we start analyzing family and friends. Sometimes we look for something just not there. Uh, so I say save it for on the job or you're watching a politician on TV. But obviously, if you've got kids, you're going to be analyzing their language, you know, if they're being truthful with you or not. And so, yeah, sometimes we can overdo it. But but the key is, is to not interpret. I mean, people mean exactly what they say. So don't overdo it and, and try to put words in their mouth. Okay. And Lena, you just got married recently, right? How's that going? I did. I did. <laughs> My husband will say, don't pull that interrogator stuff on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's the case. I mean, okay, everybody lies. Everybody lies. And we'd all agree that lying is social lubricant. Because if somebody says how you're doing at the store, they really don't want to hear that I just got a headache and my day's been long. They probably want me to lie and just say, fine, thank you. Right. <laughs> or whatever. So I, I imagine there's some of that. Or... Do you, uh, both of you, do you find yourselves looking at somebody lying to you and you're just kind of amused by it? You know they're lying, but you're, you're just kind of like, okay. You, know, you can convince yourself that. Well, I know sometimes if I get wind that somebody's lying to me, and it really doesn't matter, and if you're lying to make me feel good, I'll let it go. I always tell people I pick and choose my battles. Now, if you lie to me to hurt me, oh, I'm going to take you down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um but no got to pick Well didn't you in your book I think you wrote about four uh motivations of lying right I can't, I can't remember if that was your book but you know you're lying to get ahead or you're lying to protect or you're lying just to be destructive or was that in yours I can't remember No I talk about there's the four types of lies but yeah, I mean, we lie for a million different reasons. One, because I want to lie to because uh, my own self-worth or um, mm -hmm. to get something, right? I'm lying because I want to better myself. I'm lying to help other people. I'm lying because I'm embarrassed and I don't want to admit the truth. There's so many reasons that people lie. Okay. And some are more malicious than others. Oh, right? yeah, definitely. You yeah. Know, some people will lie just to destroy their quote friends relationship because they're envious yes. and th that serves nothing that doesn't get them ahead that does nothing except destroy somebody else's mm -hmm. have you found that mark that the different types of lies and yeah there's d definitely different types of lies as, as both of you have pointed out and, and people lie for var various reasons um most of the people I deal with, at least with uh, in investigations, they're lying to, to save themselves. Usually, they don't want to admit they got they did something wrong or go to prison. Uh, but but as you pointed out, people lie every day. Uh, sometimes they're just what we would call white lies. It's you know they don't really uh, they're not hurting anybody, just trying to get through the day. Uh, but then you do have people that are more malicious and and can't deal with certain friendships or relationships, and so they end up you know lying. 
Have you ever, Mark, run into a situation where somebody is lying very obviously to the point where you start to suspect them, but it's actually not them. They're lying to protect somebody or someone else. Uh, yeah, I've seen that where, as you said, you know, they're lying. And so it's a matter of why they lie. And it all depends what the investigation is, what you're looking into. Uh, but sometimes there's indications that, you know, they didn't do it, but they know who did it. Mm -hmm. And so, and, that, and that if you pick up on that, then, then that helps you as an interviewer because, you know, you know, the person you're interviewing is innocent. They didn't do it. So that helps you and that you can, you know, they're not going to be in trouble, but you're just trying to get the truth out of them. And hopefully you can get them to admit what other additional information they have that they haven't shared with you. Well, and this is to both of you. Do you treat someone differently who you feel is a suspect versus somebody who you feel is a witness or knowledgeable person? Uh, I, I don't. When I train um, people to conduct interviews and interrogations, it, it's really have six kind of um, bylaws to go by and it's all non-accusatory. And I also have a golden rule that I tell people and it is don't tell, ask. So I don't tell people I'm interviewing anything. I'm not going to tell you why you did what you did. If I don't know it, why would I do that? Right. And it just gives you a way out. So I am very hardcore with, I have a whole bunch of techniques that I use to allow that person to want to open up and tell me what they did and why they did it. Because the moment I start assigning why you did something, whether well, you're going to soften it up, take the lesser route, you know, and I just give you a way out and I don't want to do that. So it's really an art of being able to create an environment to gain that trust and to allow people to open up and tell you why they did and what they did. Do you ever project into that? Because I, 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 I'm very interested in the difference between negotiation and interrogation because I feel like there's some crossover. And one of the things about negotiations is sometimes you do project into them. You mm -hmm. do say, you know, this se you seem like you must be really scared right now. Mm -hmm. Or you seem like we're going to do such and such. Do you ever do that? Do you ever project into them like this must be an intimidating environment with you in this cold room with these hard shit, you know, anything like that? So I really try hard not to use leading questions. And I really try hard not to lead a person to feel something or to think something. I always stick to interrogative. So instead of saying, you know, you seem really nervous. My question is simply, how do you feel right now? How did you feel about what I just said? How do you feel about the environment? Because I don't want to sway um, their information and I certainly don't want to change up any information that they have or um, you know, affect their memory. So I really stick to interrogatives and asking those types of questions rather than you know, doing hypotheticals. And Mark? Yeah, I agree. You're trying to establish a rapport with this person um, and so, you know, you want to be their friend, you want to get them talking to you. And, and so as Lena pointed out, that's what, that's the road you want to go down. You don't want to accuse them of anything and just, just get them talking to you. How, whatever you got to say to get them to open up, that's what you're going to do. Okay. Okay. And that leads right into a next question here. What to say to get people to open up? Oh, oh, I got an answer. <laughs> I usually start every interview off with an interrogative question because that gets a narrative response. And sometimes it will be as simple as, how did you get here? Okay. That's it. What's going on? So when I used to work on the TV show, I would lean in and use humor because my personality, I can get away with that and say, all right, listen, I have to know how on earth did you get on the show? And it's kind of funny. It lowers the stress in the room. They think I don't take myself too seriously. So they're like, okay, I can open up to her and answer. And then I just pull the thread and I keep asking, you know, interrogative questions. Sometimes I use elicitation, which is my go-to to relax people and still get them to talk. Mark. Yeah, that's what you want to do. What I what I tell them, you want to establish a rapport with this person. So you might ask them some type of open-ended question that's going to require some type of extended response from them. As Lena said, it could be something as simple as, you know, how'd you get here today? Or just how, how's your day going? Or tell me a little bit about yourself or something like that. But you want to get them talking to you. So when you start asking more sensitive questions, hopefully that information will still flow from them. 
Um, do you act differently towards different people you're interact, interacting with? Ideally, I try to act the same no matter whom I'm interviewing, but it depends on the person you're interviewing, you know, what their responses are. You know, as we talked about a little bit earlier, if they're not going to answer any questions, just sit there or give you one word answers. That makes it you know, a little bit difficult. You may have to change tactics a little bit, but you still, you know, try to stick to the same, you know, same things we're talking about. Try to get them talking to you, establish that rapport. You know, I tell people if they're not going to answer your questions, then you change them to verifying questions, you know, and at least get them to answer yes or no. That way they said something at the very least. And then you're hoping okay. they'll start to open up a little bit more. So do you sometimes just jump to things like, um, so you're married, do you have any kids? That kind of thing, do you, you know, just uh, you general questions. Do that. Um, even if it's something as, you know, what is your name? And they're just sitting there, you know, and they don't want to say anything. Well, more than likely, you know what their name is. Is your name John Doe? Yeah. All right. You got to say something. It's not, not very much, but at least it's a start. And that's what you're hoping to get them to warm up a little bit. And, you know, some people talk more than others. We know that, but, but that's what you're looking at. Now, one more question on that though. Um, what if their answer is lawyer? Is that something you're actively trying to avoid is, you know, get them to answer a question because if they corner too much, they just say, my name is, I want a lawyer. <laughs> so or if, they're, if they want to ask for a lawyer, is that what you're saying? Right. Right. I mean, if they want a lawyer or they demand a lawyer, it does stop the entire interrogation, doesn't it? Yeah, if, if they're asking for, it depends on the type of interview, but yeah, if, if it's a police interview, it's a you know, suspect, they ask for an attorney, a lawyer, then yeah, you've got to provide them with that. And so, you know, that, that's just something that could happen. That's why you don't go in there accusing them immediately. Again, like Lena's saying, you just start asking them questions, get them talking to you, and, you know, and see if they're going to be truthful or, or deceptive. Okay, now Lena. Correct me if I'm wrong. I could picture you being playful and your Rhode Island accent maybe going up a little bit sometimes. Yeah. Guilty of that, maybe? Oh, definitely. <laughs> okay. So it's the same thing. You're trying to establish a comfort or rapport, whichever way you can, right? Yeah, I think my go-to way to establish rapport is exploiting the similar to me bias, right? Because when I can become more similar to you, when I can become like you, you like me more. So it's, I start to mirror you and I can mirror you in your personality preference, which is huge for me. Um, I am an extreme extrovert and sometimes I'm interviewing introverts, so I got to tone it down. Um, mm. I and mirror your tone of voice and your rate of speech and even some vocabulary words that you use. I'll never forget, there was one um, interview I did with a litigant on the TV show and I knew he was lying. It was so clear, he wouldn't come clean. And we had a great report though. We were joking and laughing and I'm like, I'm gonna get him to confess. I wanna get him. Um, and it took me 45 minutes, but I got him to confess. But it was on one word, cause I mirrored a word that he used. And as soon as I use it, it was like, oh, she's speaking my lingo, right? And I became like him and immediately he just warmed up to me and then eventually said, you got me. This is what I did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next uh, question. This is Gavin Stone and Gavin is a member of the channel, folks. So yeah. he really appreciates, he actually donates to help uh, keep the channel going. So we love that Gavin is a hero. You like Gavin. Mm -hmm. This question is, I recently came across a situation where the person said, I will reframe from answering and genuinely believe this is the correct terminology as opposed, as opposed to reframe. Have you ever had similar issues? Um, I can come up with one myself. It's a yeah. mute point. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, so um, we just did on the profiler task force, we just analyzed the DC sniper case. And what we haven't shown you yet, we did the um, Lee Boyd Malvo, but we had we also analyzed John Mohammed and we haven't mm. yet. We're saving it. But anyway, 
John Muhammad, when he went to represent himself, he gave, stood up in front of the court and he was going on this huge long speech. And he said, I call it a word slip, right? He said, um, and by the grace of God, you'll find me guilty. I, I mean, innocent. <laughs> <laughs> what right and so when people do a if they do a huge word slip like that it just tells me where your mind is right but sure. also some people who are don't have the educational background and maybe they truly thought that that word was that word right so you have to baseline people to see whether or not it's just a grammar you know, like educational thing a knowledge thing or is it because they're concealing something so for years um i'll share this very embarrassing thing but for years i grew up with my you know family who has a very thick accent and my dad would say get the kindlin wood to start the fire right so i grew up calling it kindlin I thought it was spelled oh. I N L I N, Kin Lin. <laughs> and I came to Virginia, I was talking to someone, and I said, oh, We need Kinlin. And they're like, What? I go, Kinlin, we need Kinlin to start the fire. They're like, We have no idea what you're saying. I'm like, The little pieces of wood, Kinlin. They're like, Oh, Kindling? Or I don't even know how to say it. So it could be something like that. <laughs> don't feel bad. Uh, my wife used to make fun of me because I grew up saying rune instead of ruin. Oh. Ah. Okay. And and I think that might even be a regional thing, but it, it, it's a slip, and I would do it forever. So now she she determined that she found it cute, so she gets mad because I say it correctly all the time, and she's like, "No, say it again, say it again, come on, say it again." Now on that same note about the um, I I can imagine his case is like, "Don't act guilty, don't act guilty, don't look guilty, don't act guilty," and he says the word guilty. Mark, you've written a bit about that, that you like having written statements. Is it for just that purpose? Because they start to write one thing and wind up scratching out, writing something else? Yeah, sometimes in a written statement, we'll see the same slip ups. And, and as you mentioned, though, uh, you give them a pen, not a pencil, that way they can't erase. And then sometimes they'll start to write the truth and realize, well, I can't write that. That's incriminating. So they cross it out. And then you give them instructions just to draw a single line through. So we'd like to see what they cross out. They may not abide by that, but at least they can't erase it now. And sometimes you can glean some information from, you know, crossed out words. Uh, I mean, a good example was the OJ Simpson in his uh, so-called suicide note, but he started out by saying to whom, to whom may concern first, everyone understand had nothing to do with Nicole's murder, but he crossed out the words I had. But you never hear it read that way. You never see it printed that way. But the way it reads is everyone understand nothing to do with Nicole's murder. He didn't say who had nothing to do with Nicole's murder. He took himself out of that denial by crossing out the words mm. I had. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes mm. you can uh, obtain additional information by, from crossed out words and looking at this, if you can tell what the person had written and crossed out. Uh, Lena does a show called Profiler Task Force um, with uh, three other ladies, and one of them is Michelle Dresbold, mm -hmm. who does handwriting analysis. And I wonder if she would say that there's something about the trip there, too, where when you have to concentrate on writing, getting the signal from your brain to your hand leads into kind of a purity of thought in some ways, too, and it might be a slip up. Have you heard anything like that, uh, Mark? Or? Well, they say, you know, handwriting is brain writing. And so that's that mm -hmm. would follow along that, that same line there where people, um, again, about to write the truth and then realize, well, I can't write that. Or sometimes uh, they may, as they're thinking too much, the hand keeps moving across the page. They might have a wider space in between two certain words that you don't see throughout the rest of the handwriting. So why is it there? There's a reason for it. Doesn't mean they're being deceptive, but there's, you know, you want to pick up on that and, and ask a few more questions about that area of their of their written statement what, what were they thinking at that point that caused them to do that oh perfect and well we're talking about you know fun folks like lee malvo and uh john mcdonald uh, on lena's other show profiler task force they did a some coverage on lee malvo because he is technically maybe up for parole in virginia don't worry about it he's got five life sentences in maryland even if he does get parole so the guy's not getting out but Lena, you did some statement analysis on him. And I brought that here so we could kind of discuss what you were talking about. Okay. And I would love Mark's input. I'm excited. <laughs> okay. So the, the first statement here is um, 
we can never change what happened. There's nothing I can say, no apologies. There's nothing I can say except that don't allow me and my actions to continue to victimize you for the rest of your life. It may sound cold, but it isn't. It's the only sound thing I can offer. Now you have some notes here, and if you could just talk through it a little bit. And yeah, Mark, sure. jump in, please. Um, so how it starts off, we can never change what happened. I don't like the we. He should be saying, I can never change what happened because I did this stuff. So now some people may say, well, he could be talking about him and John. And yes, I'm not a mind reader, so that could be, but John's dead. And he is now talking about himself and, you know, trying to defend himself. So he says, we can never change what happened. I really want to hear I, because when you hear that I, it tells me you're taking accountability and responsibility for what you're saying. So then, of course, he goes on to say, well, there's nothing I can say. No apologies. There's nothing I can say. Um, everybody can say something. It's like when people say, well, I have no idea. Well, everybody has ideas, all right? So it's just kind of a cover up. I, obviously, I'm not gonna believe it because you can say something. You could apologize. You could do a million other things. So the fact that you're telling me that you have nothing to say is a lie because there is something you could say. And then he goes on, oh, except, <laughs> right? So except, um, don't allow me and my actions. So he takes accountability there. I see that my, but he also says my actions. So he doesn't talk about don't, you know, how I killed people. It's just my actions. So actions to me is a little softer word for murdering and killing people. Um, going on to, it may sound cold. Okay, so I always like to say the truth is in our words and people use words for a specific reason, whether it's wittingly or unwittingly, the truth comes out. So the fact that he just says, well, it may sound cold tells me he, know it's, he knows it sounds cold. Right. And then you see, but, and I call this the but syndrome. So, but is a coordinating conjunction usually negates something in most examples. It negates what comes before, but sometimes it negates what comes after. Um, but if you look at this, if you negate what comes before, then you're left with, you know, it isn't, what is it? Right. And he uses all these, um, the it and then this, and he never talks about exactly what he did. And then he finally says it's, the only sound thing I can offer. Again, it's what is it? We don't know. And the only minimizing language, right? So when people use just and only, it just tells me that they just want to get off the topic. Don't think about it. We're going to move on really fast. We're going to minimize it because it, it's not important. So let's move on over here. And then he says, the sound thing I can offer. And this is what I wanted to ask Mark on especially. Why would he use that word sound? It's the only sound thing I can offer. And so it stumped me. I don't really have an answer for it. Yeah, that is tricky because the word sound is not needed. It's the only thing I can offer is what most people would say. Uh, and so why did he say it's the only sound thing I can offer? Maybe convincing, just a convincing language. It could be for convincing language. Well, mm -hmm. sound is stable or valuable. Maybe he has no value, and that is the only valuable or sound structural thing that he can offer. Because I think of sound as being structurally, oh, yeah, so structurally place, yeah. something right. you can stand on. Some actually something you can stand on. It's sound. That's a good point. Yeah. Mm. It just now, I, Mark. You have to. You have to do your. Um, I believe it was in your interview. We talked about what butt meant. Yeah, but I mean, it's been said that the word but stands for uh, behold the underlying truth. And as Lena said, whatever comes before that, you can disregard it. What comes after it is usually uh, the truth there. But it is a word you want to pick up on and, and, and take a look at it. But, but Lena's right on point. I mean, pronouns give us responsibility and the pronoun we means he's spreading that responsibility. It should be the pronoun I is what he should be using there. Not a very strong uh, apology, not really an apology at all, but just very, very weak. Right. Now, Lena, I know she had some questions ahead of time, but she was talking about the lack of I and my, and that we know that a lack of I and my can, can indicate distancing, not owning responsibility. But what about I a lot in choppy sentences? Like I, the, I, 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 I. Well, 
Yeah, there is a there is a point of using too much of the pronoun I. Now, people have to use the pronoun I for to believe they did something. You know, I went to the store, I did this. But if they use it too much, then it's a little bit indication of uh, some sensitivity. They're, they're a little bit uh, tense, a little edgy there, and so we're wondering why that is. And and a good example is the word and joins two thoughts together. So you can say, you know, I woke up and fixed breakfast. Mm. We know you did both actions because you started the sentence with the pronoun I. But some people who are a little tense might say, I woke up and I fixed breakfast. You know, that add that extra I in there after the word and, which is not not needed. And so that's one way to kind of distinguish between is it too much I versus enough I to let us know that they indeed you know did all this. Interesting. So they that's almost like you're writing something out. Like uh, I did. It, I hate to say, it, or I'm, I guess I'm projecting, but it's almost like you maybe rehearsed a story. I did this, then I did this, then I did this, then I did this. Could that be some of it? Yeah, that, that could be some of it. Um, they may be trying to convince us they did all that stuff. They keep putting the I in there when, when sometimes it's not needed. Okay. All right. Anything else that leaps out uh, to either of you? I think Lena covered it. What, what's in that? What's in his uh, statement there? All right. Let me see if I've got the next one. Oh, wow. You know what I managed to do is not go to the first one. So oh. as the talented host, <laughs> I can go back in time. Oh. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> start off with the, uh, the oh. beginning. I was a monster. If you look up the definition, that's what a monster is. I was a ghoul. I was a thief. I stole people's lives and I did someone else's bidding just because they said so. I mean, that's the definition of a monster. And this is the case. I think that's some of that was I, 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 I. So Lena. Yeah. Lena. Well, that's what I didn't like. And just what Mark said, which makes perfect sense, that being tense, right? It's just very choppy and there's too many. So it, it to me, this doesn't come across as um, a, a, a truthful emotion. There's something else going on here. And so I brought the too many eyes because even when I teach my classes, I'm like, hey, I and my shows accountability and responsibility. That's a great indicator of truthfulness. However, Right. And when I do these, um, I do an icebreaker uh, exercise where you write one story is a truthful story. One story is a lie and nobody labels them. I don't even know which one is the truth and lie. And we go through them. We do statement analysis on some and then we put mm -hmm. on the hot seat to talk about them. And some people are like, well, I thought this story was truthful because there was a ton of eyes. But I'm like, there's too many. And so at what point? Does the are there too many that it lacks the truthfulness and now can be an indicator of that stress and that deception? Okay, and I think you pointed out the someone else's bidding. Oh, that really bothered me. Oh, the bidding. Um, sorry, you killed somebody else. Told you to kill, and you did. You murdered people. You didn't do bidding. So it's just a softening, right? And he, this, in all the statements that I analyze, never once does he take accountability for killing people. And oh, by the way, some people are like, well, you know, he was working with this older guy and he was the father figure and John Muhammad had him killed. No, there was a lot of times where Lee Malvo killed on his own and John Muhammad wasn't even with him. So this is truly a person who wanted to kill people. And for whatever reason, we can go, that's a whole nother episode but he wanted to kill people and so when he softens it up and said i did someone else's john muhammad by the way not somebody else's john muhammad somebody else's bidding to me you're distancing yourself because never once in all these statements does he mention john muhammad it's almost like he wants to protect uh his image or what he felt for john muhammad at that time and then he talks about his bidding doesn't make sense mark do you see anything else in there no, just as Lena pointed out, he, he doesn't take full responsibility, you know, when we look at his language there. All right. Well, folks, um, that's a tease. If you want to learn more, go check out Lena's show, Profiler Task Force. It's named that on YouTube. And I know I've sent out a link a couple of times, so I don't want to spoil the entire thing. On that, you'll get to see handwriting analysis and everything else.
-hmm. And now next question is deception indicated. Mark, I have both your books and recently took one of your courses online. My question is in the is the we and rape cases, is it after or during for deception? And this is a good one because that's one of those really tricky for deception. Yeah, well, the we, the pronoun we, everybody knows indicates plurality. But what people don't realize is that the pronoun we also indicates a partnership, that two people agree to do something together. It doesn't mean they're best of friends. It can be a very limited partnership. But nonetheless, it means that two people collaborate together. And so we ask ourselves, should there be a we? And most of the time, the answer is yes, because people don't do things by themselves, generally speaking. But as, as the uh, uh, person pointed out, in a sexual assault case, you're not expect to see the pronoun we. Uh, the victim's not going to partner up with her uh, attacker or rapist. And so and the question was, when, when the we appears. Now, if it's like a date rape case, Again, I would expect the we not to be in there at all, but some victims might say we went to the movies, we went to dinner because they were willing participant. But then once things definitely turn ugly, you know, he forced me into his car or something like that, then that we should disappear. So to say we went into the house and he raped me would be an indication of, of deception that perhaps uh, making up the story or was a willing participant. So the we may show up in the earlier part of the story, depends on what type of uh, statement we're looking at, but definitely when things are starting to go south, uh, that, that we shouldn't be there. Us is the same way. The pronoun us also in the case of partnership. And in your book, didn't you also have that? It wasn't a, a rape case, but a, uh, a robbery case. It may show up in a robbery case, uh, like a cashier might say, uh, I, I gave him all the money out of the drawer we then went to the storage room and he tied me up. Well, again, that we means our robber and cashier hand in hand, so to speak, walked into the storage room. It should be he forced me, he made me go into the storage room and tie me up. In that case, we don't have a we, we don't have a partnership. And so I raise the red flag when somebody uses a pronoun we in a situation like that, because that's what the pronoun uh, by nature indicates that two, at least two people you know, agree to do something together. Right, confederates of some kind, not necessarily right. buddies, but that makes perfect sense. Lena. About we? Yeah. <laughs> the same thing. I, I'm not even going to say anything because what Mark said was beautiful, so I'm not going to destroy it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't know if you might have seen it um, when you're interviewing terrorists or things like that, if you ever... I, in my cases, I'm always seeing the lack of, right? I never, or in mm. place of my or I, it becomes we. Mm. Somebody else's problem. It's not me. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jed M, what books would you guys recommend on analyzing verbal communication in everyday life? Hmm, everyday life. I can be well, so I recommend my books. <laughs> I know you're a lying and don't be deceived. I um, mean, it's designed for more for an interviewer, uh, but the techniques can be used, you know, in everyday life. I mean, you're, you're, even if you don't conduct interviews, you're still listening to people, like I said, on, on politicians on television. Even it's a fictional, fictional murder mystery movie, you can sometimes figure out who did it in the first 15 minutes if you listen to how people answer questions yeah. as to how people phrase their statements because the writers know who who's going to lie which actors will lie and they have them lie just like a real person will you know most of the time um but any you know any book on detecting deception whether it's you know verbal or non-verbal uh would give you some insight as to what to, to look for to listen for okay lena Oh, gosh, I always go to, you know, my top five. So um, I did write a book, but it's it's really focused on interviewing. It does have a lot of nonverbal, but anything by Mark, by Janine Driver, by um, Greg Hartley. Fabulous, fabulous books mm -hmm. and for real interviewing too. Um, Joe Navarro, Jack Schaefer. Great books. OK. And I'm going to skip to this question, then come back up because this is directly on point. Christine H says, females are taught to say we, so if people overhear me, they won't think I live alone. Prior to using we, the I statement caused many problems. I still use we. Oh, yeah. 
Yep. No, I agree with that because you have to protect yourself. Totally. Is that something that you could run into or would that just kind of wash out over time? This is only one factor and other things will trip them up or not. Oh, definitely. If, you know, if they're being deceptive, it's going to pop up several different ways throughout their statement. And, and most statements, just because they said this one thing doesn't mean, hey, you're lying to me or you're guilty. Um, we're looking for several indications if indeed they are being deceptive or you know committed a certain act. All right. And hero of the day. See, Gavin's a hero. Five <laughs> pounds. That is awesome. Thank you, Gavin. You are a rock star, man. Um, Lena, you'll appreciate this. Yeah. I have a couple of Mark's books. Lena, I'm writing a wrong. I ordered a copy of yours today, which will <laughs> arrive tomorrow. <laughs> Fabulous. And folks, it's an audio too. Both of them have books and audio. That's really, really important because that's how I consume. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see if, okay. This could be for both of you. Hi, this is Paul Mailer. Did. I hope I got it right. Hi, if you could ask one question at the OJ trial at opening questions, what would it have been? Hmm. So I can be funny here and say, why did you title your book if, I did it. <laughs> Take out the if, what are you left with? I did it. Oops. <laughs> I can actually answer that. Yeah? He didn't write it. Um... I've had his manager on. They gave him a suitcase of money and said, here. Wow. I mean, he was already found not guilty in court. So, mm -hmm. what, 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 you know, what risk is that? So, th that one I think is a squirrely one because. He didn't actually write it. The publisher did. Apparently, it's a cash deal because he can't get paid anything because the Goldmans pretty much have all of his assets seized up. So it's a cash deal. Mark. I would ask him, did you do it? And of course, the best answer is no, but deceptive people sometimes have a hard time saying that. I mean, he might, people can lie to us and say no, but sometimes they may, you know, say something else. You know, I would never do that, which is what he always said in his interviews. I've never heard him say I didn't do it or I didn't kill Nicole and Ryan Goldman. It's always, I'm not capable of doing that. I wouldn't do that. I loved her too much. Those are all truthful statements, but I've never heard him say I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. At least well, in the first couple of years after his interviews. Saying I wouldn't do that. Well, right now, at this point in time, you probably wouldn't. You already did it. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's the word games that people play. Yeah. Okay. And isn't that true uh, that most of the time they don't directly deny it? Is that something you've both found? That's what I found most of the time. You know, some people, if you ask them a specific question, they, if they're smart, they'll say no if they're denying it. But a lot of times people uh, will not deny it. Um, they'll... Uh, They'll say something, you know, like I wouldn't do it, or mm -hmm. I think in the, uh, in the in the John Al Muhammad case, uh, because he represented himself in court, told in opening statements to the jury, told him the evidence was sh the evidence was show had nothing to do with these crimes. Mm -hmm. Now that's a lie, but it's not a direct lie. He couldn't say the evidence will show I didn't do it, mm -hmm. or somebody else is a shooter, but he just used that phrase I had nothing to do with, and and that's a common phrase that the set that people like to use because people don't want to lie surprisingly and so they do their best not to tell a direct lie if they can avoid it yeah oh sorry no no go lena if you think about anthony weiner remember back in the day and all of the reporters did you send the tweet it's a yes or no question all you have to do is say no not once could he not once not once well, okay. he could and fight but never could say no i have to point it out though that is like universally ordained. First off, he goes by the name Wiener. Okay. <laughs> I would say, no, it's Weiner. Shut up. It's an old German name. It's Weiner. I mean, can anybody be better named for the situation? That is involved? <laughs> He's doomed. He is doomed. Now, to play devil's advocate, have you had somebody who just won't directly say no and they are, in fact, innocent or not guilty? I can't think of a time. Mm -mm. No, I can't think of any that I know of. Yeah. Okay, that's fascinating because I didn't know if you get some, you know, like a lawyer who's accused, you know, and they were so worried about legally, you know, whatever statement. So that's actually encouraging to hear. Mm -hmm. um, 
trans paper. Uh, Paul Mail Mailer debt. Paul, I'm sorry if I'm getting it wrong. Your books are fantastic, Mark. Thank you. So you guys both have fans. Well, thank here. you for buying. I have to um, apologize that my light got very dark because my natural it's getting dark where I'm at. Hey, yeah, I'm you're spooky. Right. I know. It was Halloween though. There you go. <laughs> well, she's not that far down the road. Oh, uh, <laughs> let me see. Somebody wrote here, could sound speak to leakage? Sound is also noise when spoken. Could it lack commitment to what he is saying? Not sure. Could sound speak to leakage? Like with that sound, the only sound thing I can offer. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I got to tell you, my gut instinct for that is that he's trying to sound. I call, I make up this term. I call it formalizing language. When liars are trying to convince me, they try to mm. sound very formal and and um, use big words and all that. And it, to me, it just sounds very formal, um, as if to say, "Well, you have to believe me because I speak well." Mm -hmm. you know? And so that's Which my. Is effective. Gut. Hmm? That's actually usually effective too. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. When people say, well, I, I don't recall. Now, obviously, in law enforcement community, that, that's their word, right? That's their baseline. They use. <laughs> but when I have people that will flip-flop, I don't remember. Well, I can't recall that. But I don't remember. Uh, when you say I can't recall, I have a problem. It's a little... Well, any, any baby so. boomer, or, and not, well, any baby boomer or Gen Xer is going to have a problem because of Reagan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. There is, you know, things that became a meme before the term meme even existed. That definitely is one. So if we hear, I cannot recall, it's a trigger. Yeah. For Ollie North and uh, Ronald Reagan. But let me see. Da, 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 da. All right. Gavin Stone. The previous statement, I was a monster. It seemed to get watered down as he progressed. I was a monster. Look up the definition. That's what I was. As in not anymore. Then I was a ghoul and so on. So. Yeah, I am. Um, in fact, Mark, I was going to, I'm trying to plug in my light over here. Um, I was going to ask you what you thought about that when people call themselves a monster, but then all of a sudden it's a ghoul. He goes from, I'm a monster, I'm a monster. Oh, I'm a ghoul, I'm a thief. The yeah. ghoul three. I mean, obviously, he's trying to paint himself as being a bad person, uh, but does he really believe that? Bingo. That, that he's that bad of a person, you yeah. know? Go ahead and hit your light, Lena. Uh, thank Wait. you. So hold on one sec. I'm going to hit it. Hold on. All right. Could that be a rule of three too, Mark? Uh, the rule of three is the actual use of the number three. Not oh, just okay. saying something three times. Now, I mean, if somebody repeats something, the same thing three times, the repetitious is suspicious. But we're looking for the actual use of number three. Okay. Because I, I thought I had heard too that people tend to state things in sets of three. I did this and this and then this. I did this and this and this. Now, I know some of that is the traditional pattern in our language, too, so it's hard to understand or determine. Yeah, but what I what I teach is to listen for the actual use of the number three. It's, it's just an indication. It's not an absolute by no means. Uh, but and more so when people don't know the exact number, then they might use the number three. You know, I'll call you in three minutes. Well, maybe. Mm. It may be more like 10 minutes, but they don't know the exact number, so they'll use the number three, or I'll call you in 30 minutes or something like that. Okay. Okay. Let me see. Chris writes in essay statement analysis is an amazing tool for investigations. Do you have any thoughts as to why it's so widely and successfully used in the USA and not so in the UK? Well, Albert Dridge is in the UK, and I'm not sure if he's into it, but... Yeah, I'm not sure why. Um, you know, I get a lot of people from the UK that take my on-demand training, uh, and a lot of them tell me that there's just not much training over there in not just statement analysis, but any type of linguistic analysis. Uh, you know, they speak English. Now, all my studies are based on the English uh, you know, spoken in the U.S., and so we do have to take some into account uh, different uh, words that people use in the UK or Australia that we don't use in the U.S. that can affect the analysis, but generally speaking, I mean, the pronouns are all the same and, and verb tenses. Well, that's a good question. What about, um, and yes, Chris uh, wrote that. I, I know Al Aldert Bridge is an opponent of both statement analysis and scan. He's a scientist out of uh, 
out of the UK and has written some d done scientific studies and things like that is not a not a fan. Um, I just completely lost. What about dealing with different cultures? Do you have to bring other people in for consideration to, to find the different patterns? And and I'll say specifically, I'm thinking like Asian, Indian, Asian, that type, because they have different patterns sometimes of speaking or or others who speak English, but yet they're they're distant. Yeah, if, if English is not their first language, and that can account for you know using the wrong pronouns or you know verb tenses. Uh, but we do got taken cultural differences even around the U.S. There, there's different vernaculars, um, but again, most of the techniques are based on the English language, so it's still going to be tried and true. I mean, you have to abide by the rules of grammar. Now, some people may not because they have poor grammar skills. And so we take a look at that. Is that why they use a present tense verb? Because they just they don't have a, a, a formal education or what have you. Um, but as I mentioned, they're being deceptive. It's going to pop up several different ways throughout their statement. And so so we do have to take some of that into consideration, and especially if we're using it to analyze somebody um, that was not born in the U.S., but still speaks English. Now, Lena, this is especially one for you because you literally, I don't think you, did you learn Arabic completely? No. No. Okay. So, um, so you had to deal with both watching them and listening, but also an interpreter. Mm -hmm. So the interpreter themselves could maul what they are saying. Mm -hmm. How, how did you work with that? Oof. Uh, so when I would get my interpreters, first I have to train the interpreter, right, and make sure that they understand um, exactly how to translate or interpret. Um, I had great rapport with my interpreters. Oh my gosh, they were amazing. Uh, a couple of crazy instances, but um, outside of that, they were fantastic. And so when you build that rapport, they really try to work the best they can for you. And so in that instance, they know only to translate what I say and what the detainee says and not to offer any opinions or inject um, a question or take over the conversation. So all those rules are laid out up so when they understand the whole process of using an interpreter it becomes very easy but they were so valuable to me because they taught me about the cultural norms that i wasn't picking up um for example during one mm -hmm. interrogation i had detainee he was just tuning me out you know and I, I knew it i didn't know how to break into him to get him to open up to get him to talk to me whatever and so my interpreter nudged me. He's like, you know, he's praying right now. He's completely tuning you out. I'm like, what? Oh. You know, he's sitting there. He's like, look at his hands, look at his fingers. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And so, um, yeah, so they helped me out on that. They also helped me out where they would tell me, listen, stay away from this. Don't talk about X, Y, and Z because it's very taboo in their culture and you're going to lose rapport. Don't do this, but do do that. Oh, it was a wealth of knowledge, even um, the difference between guilt and shame. You know, I went down there and I tried to guilt uh, people into confessing or, or telling me what they did. And they just don't understand the concept of guilt. So it, it meant nothing to them and I wouldn't get anywhere. But shame, shame means something. And that mm. they would take to heart. So knowing your culture is huge. I used to teach a lot about um cross-cultural communication. I'm a former anthropologist, uh, an archaeologist. And so just knowing anything about that, like with Asian cultures, there's um, they're very reluctant to talk about or offer an opinion if it's going to be against what a superior person has. Um, like mm -hmm. a student and a teacher, a, a student would never say, hey, I offer up my opinion because what if it goes against the authority figure's opinion? That's terrible. Right. So it's just how they speak is completely different, too. So you really have to understand your culture before you get into doing an interview and communicating with them and being effective. That Asian thing makes me um, remember. I can't remember. I think it was Gladwell. It was either Gladwell or Freakonomics. But they had to train Korean pilots to communicate with each other in English because they were wrecking too often in planes. Wow. And the problem was that the junior pilot with their culture 
absolutely could not question or point something out to the superior and they would wind up you know losing fuel oil or whatever else it was and it was such a cultural problem mm -hmm. that they actually trained their pilots to speak english and they communicate only in english with each, with each other because culturally speaking english you can say hey that's low yes. check that do that and it stopped literally all the um the deaths um, of pilots i thought that was an interesting story mark uh did you run into any uh, cultural aspects things like that no, I've never had to use a translator. Um, you know, Lena can speak for that, but that that just does, makes it a lot harder uh, because you can't always translate word for word. That's what I tell people. If, you, if you're using a translator as best you can, word for word, what this person is saying, but that doesn't always happen going from one language into English. Uh, but try not to interpret is what, what you don't want to do. Just tell me, you know, tell me what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that would be really, really, really hard, too, because colloquialisms don't translate over. And I'm sure they spend a lot of their time just paraphrasing, like, oh, he said blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, no, what exactly right. did he say? You know, and that would be a complete nightmare. Well, there's two um, ways to interpret. You have simultaneous and alternative, right? And sometimes... Mm -hmm. Simultaneous is very, very difficult, but uh, alternative is when you have to train people to say, say exactly what they said. Even if it doesn't make sense, I need to know exactly what they said, then give me like the transliteral meaning of it. <laughs> do you ever, do you ever record it all and then go back and revisit it? You know, like you've got it at the time, but then do you go back and look again? Because I imagine, especially some things may not translate completely over, so you have to learn the cultural element or whatever, yes. and then you could read the written statement if it's written out or something like that, or do they write them out? So in my line of work, no, uh, they didn't write anything out, um, and it would be Record in their language, and I couldn't understand it, so it just didn't work for me. So it was difficult because, again, back to the culture, you have to know the cultural body language and nonverbals, as well as the verbals. And I would really look to my interpreters to help me understand, hey, what does that mean? Is this something that they naturally say or, or whatever? And then, you know, use um, my techniques to detect deception, whether it's body language or statement analysis to find out whether or not they were lying. It's a lot of layers. It was difficult, but not impossible. <laughs> okay. And Greg Javer, and I'll give this one to Mark. Can you perform essay statement analysis on an atypical sort of statement, like say the Jean Benet Ramsey ransom note? I'm not sure if you've gone over that one or not. I know it's popular. Oh, I mean the ransom note. Absolutely, you can you can analyze that. And there's a full analysis on my website, you know, statementanalysis.com. But you can learn a lot by looking at that ransom note and how. How they phrase their statements. I mean, they, they wants to believe it was a group effort, and so they start out. You know, we have your daughter; she is in our position. Lots of plural pronouns, but then later in the in the ransom note, uh, any deviation of my instructions, what should be our instructions, but changing pronouns an indication of deception. So they start out with all these plural pronouns, but then the writer gives himself away when he uses the pronoun my. And this was not a group effort. This was probably one person, you know, writing this note. Because even though one person wrote it, if they have, if it's for a group, they'll have a group mentality and they'll always use plural pronouns because we have your daughter. And so right off the bat, we know this was not a, a group effort. It wasn't a terrorist effort. You know, they mentioned foreign faction. That, that's ridiculous. Um, and so you can learn a lot by even, you know, looking at that, at that ransom note. And then there, there's just, there's a lot of things in there to look at. Um, Specificity of what they are demanding. Oh, they demand well because I'm not yeah, what was it? A uh, hundred eighteen thousand dollars or something like that. A very odd number. I mean, it was his bonus, or is very close to his bonus, something like that. Close to his bonus. It's a very low number for the money he had. But but everything a person says has a meaning. So there's a reason why that number's in there. And as you pointed out, uh, the word was that was his bonus. You know that year. And hmm. so there's lots of things that you can look at in there. Uh, towards the it starts out, Mr. Ramsey, which is what we expect the note to say, but at the very end, is it's a very long ransom note, uh, they refer to him as John uh, three mm -hmm. times. Well, you know, that's just too personal. Whoever wrote that ransom note knows John Ramsey. That's, that's the bottom line. It should be Mr. Ramsey throughout the entire ransom note. So there's a lot to be gained 
by uh, looking at that ransom note, how they, it's a certain words they use and certain phrases they use. Is it general speculation that it is the parents or is it general speculation that it is not the parents, that it's probably somebody else, but who knows them? I think the general speculation is that it was somebody in that household. So that leaves you with three people. <laughs> I'm not going to say which one I think it is. <laughs> Notice I carefully worded what I stated. Um, but yeah, I think most people do not believe there's an intruder, so that's what you're left with then. I mean, I guess they could uh, a third party could have came over, you know, been in the house with them, and they're protecting that person, but it seems unlikely. It was, it was probably somebody in the house. Mm -hmm. Lena, I think... Mm -hmm. Don't you have a particular love for Amanda Knox? Is that oh, yes. one? <laughs> Mark, have you explored that by chance? I have not. I haven't looked at any of her statements. Okay, well, there you go. I, I, I wanted to throw that out there, Lena, because I, I know that you kind of <laughs> kind of mentioned it a couple of few times. Just a few. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump ahead and then jump back for the last question. But here, as a British person studying and working in the States, the differences in language and wording is so different, you wouldn't know. I've struggled more than you know. Mm -hmm. I actually have a story for that. In high school, there was a uh, British transfer student. I went to Tucson, and we had IBM. And that was nicknamed I've Been Moved. Mm -hmm. So we had people coming from all around the world because they you know, would move with IBM into the country. And a very attractive British female, um, you know, I kind of had a little crush on her, was there. And she came up to me and asked, do you have a rubber? Oh. <laughs> and I was, um, the connotation was like, what? Hmm? What? Uh, 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 I, unfortunately, I didn't say anything really stupid. And I learned it was a pencil eraser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I, I can imagine that. There are many such things, obviously, cigarette and fag and things like that. I have one more great question that I thought would be perfect to close on. Um, here we go. And this is almost a wide open question, so just do your best and we'll roll it out. And that is, Paul Mailerdet, um, are there any questions that work in opening up all personality types irrespective of race? <laughs> I'll go with Mark. <laughs> um, I'm not sure about about that one. Uh, Lena's probably had more experience in interviewing <laughs> all kinds of people <laughs> from different countries. And yeah, I just say again, go back to know your people. Okay, so know ethnic background they are, um, know what their taboo subjects are, know their license, as, as much information as you can know about that person so you don't put your foot in your mouth. Um, and then, you know, you play to that advantage of what you know and guide the conversation to what you think they would like and be happy and relaxed. And so that's how you open up on that. And there's sometimes I've gone into an interview and somebody just said, go in and talk to them. Okay, I don't know what they've done, where they, you know, I have nothing. So I literally do a quick assessment and I just open it up. How are you feeling? I'm just an open ended question. Um, or I come in and I'll do like an elicitation. It's like, oh my gosh, it's hot today. I can't believe this weather. You know, just makes a, a, a comment about something benign the weather, um, the sports show, a football team, whatever it is, just to break the ice and ease tensions. But know your people, know their personalities, know their likes and dislikes, know what is going to be offensive to them, know their culture. Okay. And do you, um, and I'm going to just throw out assumptions. Do you just kind of look for things that you assume everybody has? You know, like we all generally care about our family, mm -hmm. generally care about the people around us mm -hmm. being okay, things like that. Um, is that a good place to start? It is, but you'll quickly know by the answer whether or not they generally care or they don't. And so when I bump into the road and I'm like, that's not the way to go, reroute, go somewhere else because that's not what this is. Well, that's an answer too. <laughs> that's actually an answer too, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. All right. 
And we have another hero, Chris. Thank you. Great interview. Uh, five pounds. I love the British contingent. We're holding, we're keeping them up late and they're generous. I mean, what more could I ask for? Yeah. Oh, Great that's interview. Right. I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Thank you, Eric, Mark, and Lena. My view from left to right as I see you on the screen. Yeah, mine too, actually. So thank you very much. And everybody, I need to let our British contingent go for the day and go to bed. If you like this show, please subscribe. Go visit Mark at statementanalysis.com, right? Right. And Lena, you are at, I forgot your site, I apologize. No, that's okay. So it's thecongruencygroup.com right. or you can look me up at the profile or taskforce.com. Yes. And if you haven't subscribed here, please subscribe. Go subscribe to Profiler Task Force. We'll probably do crossover stuff back and forth anyway. And be on the lookout. Mark is conducting training all the time, you know, top of the line. At least get his books and get involved. Learn what it's all about. It is really, really cool. And both of you, thank you so much. Thank you.